Recovery. All right, so let me share my screen and make sure that we are starting to see what we want. Uh, so can everybody see my Zoom now? Can you see my Jupyter Lab? So I made some small changes to the lab yesterday night. I mean, there is no change in code, but I changed some variable names and added some more comments so that the code is more readable. Um, I will upload the new version of the lab with changed variable names and add, added comments after the lab. But uh, the lab should still execute. There is no problem in execution. Every cell works as such. Uh, should I wait for a little longer? It's 45 people right now. Okay. All right, so uh, let's start with today's lab. So today in the lecture, you learned about dialogue modeling. You also learned about some inference algorithm. So the objective of the lab today is the following. First, we are going to do a recap of dialogue modeling. We are again going to see what it actually means to model dialogue or what we actually mean by this particular term. Then, like you saw in the class, you're going to use a seek to seek architecture to do that. So we'll look at seek to seek architecture again. You saw it with Foo yesterday. We'll do a very quick review. Then we are going to go and look in detail as to what this greedy decoding is and how to implement this in practice. And in the second section, you will actually train a dialogue model by yourself. So we will train a seek to seek algorithm to do dialogue modeling and we will do greedy decoding on this particular algorithm on this particular model that we trained. Then we will look at something called nucleus sampling, which is very related to top case sampling that Sho spoke about in the lecture. Then we will look at beam search which by the questions that you asked in chat, I assume that you liked a lot. And then finally, we'll make an interactive chatbot. So we will take the model that we built and then wrap it into a function, which makes it into a conversation agent. So we'll be able to talk to the chatbot, get responses, and then see how it goes. So at the end of it, um, if possible, I will show you how to do the interactive chatbot with a package called Parlay. So there is, uh, there's going to be a text file um, in the document that you downloaded. So this has instructions on how to set it up. We'll see if we get there. So my hope is to finish all of these in five in one hour. So like you can imagine, we are not going to go in super detail into the code. I will explain things and I will highlight important parts of the code. And then if you have questions, you can go through the notebook and ask us on campus. Great. So let's look at <clears throat> what we are going to do today. So we are going to look at this Conway AI data set. So in this, um, you basically have persona for both the people who are talking. This is something like what we saw in the lecture. So for person one, it's like, I like to ski. My wife does not like me anymore. I have went to Mexico four times a year. I hate Mexican food and blah, blah, blah. Person two says, I'm an artist. I have four children. I recently got a cat, so on, so on. So a typical dialogue goes something like this. Person one says, hi. Person two says, hello, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, how are you? Great, thanks. So you can see how this goes. So this is a typical conversation that goes on. But here, um, like when this person one says, I'm good, thank you, how are you? Person two answers, great, thanks. My children and I were just about to watch Game of Thrones. 
So you see that it uses some stuff from the persona to make uh, it into the conversation. So I would like to emphasize that what you're seeing here is not generated by a machine. This is the actual data set where two people were given these personalities and then asked to talk to each other. Okay, all right. So now if we were to do this ourselves, so if we were to use all the NLP that you learned till now in the last two days, how would you do this? So what, how would you frame this uh, as a task that you already know? So if you look at this particular conversation here, so person one says hi, person two says something, person one says something again, and then you get a response. So here, ultimately conversation is a token, a stream of token or a sequence of tokens coming in as input and another stream of tokens going in as output. So this is very similar to what you saw in machine translation. So in machine translation, you had a source sequence coming, a, a sentence in the source language. Yesterday it was English giving us input, going as input to the machine. And then you had a sentence in French coming as output in the machine. So it's again like a sequence that comes as input and a sequence that goes as output. So it's the exact same thing again. A sequence is coming as input and the sequence is going as output. But what's a crucial difference between machine translation and dialogue modeling? Can somebody raise your hands if you want to talk and I can unmute or can somebody type? How do you think machine translation is different from dialogue modeling? Okay. Um, the number of good responses huge. Yes, good. But in um, respect to formatting, like the way the data is formatted as an input to the model, how is it different? So when we think about machine translation, what we had as input was always the source sentence. And then based on just that particular source sentence, we were giving the translated sentence. But a crucial difference here in dialogue modeling is that the response that a person is going to give at a particular time step, like let's say for this particular, I do not have a children, I do not have children at the moment, is not just going to depend on I do not have children at the moment. It's going to depend on the entire context before that. So we need some way to take into account this entire context as well. And here we do a very easy, I mean, very naive way of doing it. It is concatenating everything together. So the source sentence is going to be all the things in the conversation that has happened till that particular time period. And then when you have personas, you are going to append the personas also before that. So you're going to have a really huge source sentence, which has the persona and all the conversation history until that particular point. Is there any questions about what we spoke till now? If things are clear, please say yes. If you have any questions, please ask the question. Okay, great. So let's, uh, how is the persona fed into the model? So the persona is fed again as a stream of sentences. So you will see it in a minute how it's fed. So a typical input to your model will look like this. So it will say your persona, I had a gig at the local theater last night. Your persona, I work as a stand-up comedian. Your persona, I come from a small town. Your persona and so on and so on. And then after you have all this persona, you will also see that the conversation that is happening is also embedded in this. Like for example, uh, I can tell, I can tell I'm not, you can see me in some TV show, really, what show? I like TV, it makes me forget I do not like my family. So, so and so on. And then finally, the last thing that happened is I prefer mojitos, watermelon or cucumber. So that was the last thing the person said. And the expected label or the expected response to this is those are really yummy too, but not my favorite. So when we train a machine learning, when we train a machine translation system or a sequence to sequence system to do dialogue modeling, this entire thing, starting from your persona till not my favorite is going as input. So does this answer your question? This entire thing goes as input to your model and then your model is expected to produce an output. Those are really me too, but not my favorite. Okay, so this is how your raw JSON file looks like as well. So now we are going to very quickly go through the pre-processing steps. We are not going to look this in detail at all. So you saw this in language modeling lab, you saw this in NMT lab. So here we are again going to just quickly go through this and 
tell you how the pre-processing is done. Okay. So the first step, as you know, is to tokenize. What we mean by tokenize, if you have a sentence like this, we basically split it up into tokens. Okay. So these are how the tokens looks like for this particular sentence. Now, after that, we want to create a dictionary or a vocabulary. So these are the special tokens in the vocabulary. Null, start, end. Uh, then these are, I mean, so you basically read the tokens, you count the frequency. You can say that only if the frequency is more than a certain number, I'm going to include it in my vocabulary. If not, I'm not going to include this. So you keep doing this, okay? Uh, then once you create the vocabulary, you have the data set class. So we saw the data set class before. So what this data set class is supposed to do, it's supposed to read your corpus or it's supposed to read the JSON file in this particular case and then give you X comma Y pairs. So here the X comma Y pair, the X is going to be your entire persona and conversation history tokenized and then converted into indices. And yet the Y is going to be the expected response that you want to get. So padding and batching. So you saw that um, when you make batches, um, different sentences can be of different length but you want the patches to have one maximum length. So if the sentence is below this particular maximum length, you're going to pad it. Uh, you make batches out of this. And finally, in this particular cell, we are just going to make the train data set and validation data set. So this is how the first element of the train data set looks like. So it's a bunch of indices. So this is supposed to have your persona and the conversation history until that particular point. And then this is the expected output. Okay, so for the machine, it's just a bunch of indices that comes in and a bunch of indices that comes in. And trail loader and valid loader are uh, the data loaders which takes in this particular data set class. Okay, great. So now we are going to talk a little bit about uh, seek to seek model and how this is going to work. So uh, let me think of. I think I don't need to write here. I can just show the picture and then it should be fine. So we are going to use a model with attention. So again, in seek to seek, just to recap, what happened is in the encoder side, you had tokens going in. It went through the embedding layer and you got embeddings here. That went into the encoder side RNN. And this encoder side, whatever you got, the final hidden layer goes as input to the decoder RNN. And at every time step, you basically, uh, so here you put in the beginning of sentence token, then you have a probability distribution over the next token, you decode that, and then the next thing goes as input and so on. Right, that's how seek to seek worked. So um, I want to talk for a minute about the embedding. So in the NMT system, you had an embedding for the RNN in the source side and the RNN in the target site differently because you are working with two different languages, right? You had English and French here. So the vocabulary was different. But in chat system, in dialogue system, we can often share the embedding layer here. So in the source side and the target side, you have English as a language in this particular case. So I'll basically just use one particular embedding layer and share it across both, okay? So that is what you see by this shared LT here. So on the encoder side, all I have is a GRU. So that's basically the only thing that the only thing that I care about on the encoder side, all I have is a GRU. And then if my shared LT, which is uh, if my shared uh, embedding is true, then I basically share an embedding with the decoder. Otherwise, I have a separate embedding. So in this particular case, I actually share an embedding with the decoder. So again, if you look at the decoder RNN, there are two things that are important here. One is I mean, you have the embedding layer as always. Then you have the GRU again. The GRUs are the ones that correspond to these particular boxes here. And then you have the attention layer. So we are not going to speak about attention in detail. Um, if we have time, which I highly doubt, but at the end of the lab, if we have time, I'll go back and try to explain the attention that we use here. It's very similar to what you saw yesterday, but I would like to explain it again if you have time. But right now, let's just move on. So what's another important component that we have for the decoder? That's the projection layer or the linear layer that takes in the hidden size and projects to the vocabulary size. So this is where we get the probability distribution of tokens. Um, so I have a method called decode force within the decoder. 
So decode force is doing teacher forcing. Uh, it's used during the train time. So you saw yesterday during machine translation that you can use this trick called teacher forcing, where during the training time, instead of feeding the decoded token in the next time step, you use the actual target token. So this function is actually doing that. Um, I don't think anything else is important. Okay. So now to give an overview in the generic seek to seek class, we have a decoder, we have an encoder, and that's about it. Okay. So these train steps and val steps uses uh, the train and validation functions defined within the encoder and decoder. So please go through this, and if you have any questions, let us know on campus. Sir. All right. Um, so these are all different options. I'm setting up the hyperparameters. What vocabulary size do I want? How many layers do I need? All these things. And this is my train loop. Again, we are not going to go through the train loop. You already saw the train loop a couple of times. And there is, um, so if you look at the train loop of a machine translation system and um, this dialogue modeling system, you'll actually see absolutely no difference. So once we set up the problem, once we set up the data loader in the way that we want it, assuming all the context, machine translation problem is exactly the same as this dialogue modeling problem. So if you look at the rest of the code, there is absolutely no difference. All right. So these are the loss curves and these are the validation perplexity curves, I mean validation and train perplexity curves of the model that I trained. Again, you can train it yourself and see how these things come out. All right, so let's talk about greedy search for a minute. Um, so we have reached greedy search. Let's talk about greedy search and then see how things move on from here. So when we had RNN, just to recap, on the decoder side, we put in an SOS tag. And then from the hidden, we made a set of, um, so we have a probability distribution, which is of the size vocabulary. And then in greedy search, what did we do? We took the best one and then inputted it again, right? Just to make sure that you are. And then in the next time step again, we have a, so this is a hidden from RNN going. And in the next time step again, we have a probability distribution over the vocabulary size that goes as input to the next time step. Okay, so this is how the decoding step works. And again, at every time point here, what we are trying to model is the probability of the next token, given all the tokens until this time period. And in case of machine translation or deco or dialogue, you also have a context here. This context could be a source sentence or your dialogue history or anything. And this is exactly the same as what happened in condition language modeling as well, as you saw. So this is essentially a condition language model. So let me look at an example that I have prepared. Okay, so let's look at this particular example. So in this particular example, what I have is um, a vocabulary of basically just three words. And I'm doing a decoding step. So when I'm doing a decoding step, um, this is the first, so what I have here, this is the first SOS, um, the probability given SOS, the probability distribution at the first time step. Then if I pick this particular token, if I pick this token, then this is how it proceeds. If I pick this token, this is how it proceeds. If I pick this token, this is how it proceeds. So does everybody understand this picture? If you understand this picture, please say yes. If you don't, please say no, so that I can explain more. No, okay, great. So uh, let me, so in RNN, so let's look at the decoder RNN again, okay? In the decoder RNN, you have SOS tag coming in. Once you have the SOS tag coming in, you have like, um, you have some computation that goes on internally, and then finally you go to the linear layer. When you go to the linear layer, you project it to a vector which has dimensions of vocabulary. Is everybody okay with this? Yes or no? Very quickly, please. Yes, okay. So what I show here 
is basically this. This is the probability of the next token given SOS. My vocabulary currently only has three words. So that's why this vector is of dimension three. And if you look at the entries, they add up to one. So this is a probability distribution. So what I show here in yellow is what you have here. Are we okay with this? Yes or no? Yes, okay, great. All right. so now that you know this, um, so in the next particular time step that is here, so if at the first time point I had picked 0.1, then this is the probability distribution in the next one. So this is basically P of the next token given A and SOS. Are we okay with this? Yes or no? Yes, great. Okay, so now I hope everybody understands this picture. So let's look at... Uh, So let's look at what it means to do greedy decoding. So before we do greedy decoding, I want to do a very quick recap because uh, we had some questions during the lecture and I told I will review it during the uh, lab. So if you have, uh, so when you're decoding like this, and let's say your decoded sequence has T time steps. So I have T dots. So what is the total number of possible sequences I have if I have T possible time slots? The first one has V, the second one has V possibilities, the third one has V's possibilities and so on, right? So the total possible number of sequences is basically V raised to T. So if you take any possible vocabulary size, like if you say that V is 50,000, and if you say that T, which is my maximum sentence length is something like 20, this 50,000 raised to 20 is a huge number. It might not look so huge when you just see it like this, but uh, this number is possibly much greater than the number of atoms in the universe. So this is a really, really huge number. So it's almost impossible to do exhaustive search over all these possible sequences, okay? So what we are seeing here is a very reduced uh, scenario where I have three particular words. I have three words in my vocabulary and then I expanded it to three time step. Again, I did not expand everything. I did not expand the one corresponding to A because we I cannot see this. Sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Uh, so I did not expand the one corresponding to A. Uh, so here, let's look at what happens. So if I'm doing greedy decoding, so this is the entire possibilities and what I have in red is the probability of this particular sequence up to time step two. And what I have in yellow is the computer probability of this sequence up to third time step. So if I'm doing greedy decoding, what's the thing that I'm going to decode in the first time step? So in the first time step, I want to pick the one with the maximum probability. So what's the element that I'm going to pick, A, B or C? Correct. Uh, can I just, I'm having a hard time looking at the chat and this together because the chat is in a different window and I have no idea how to get it together. And now I cannot see the chat at all. Can somebody type anything in chat? Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we are going to decode is C, right? So once I pick C, I get this particular probability distribution that I see here. Now, when you are doing greedy decoding, what's the one that you're going to pick here? So I'm going to pick the one with the maximum. So I'm going to pick four again. So I picked this particular path. So now once I pick this path, where do I go? I go to the one with this. So what's the path that I'm going to take? What's the one that I'm going to pick? Am I going to pick A, B or C? I'm going to pick B. 
So if I do greedy decoding, this is the path that I will take. So you see that if I take this particular path, I have a maximum probability of 0.8. So is this the best possible sequence in this example? Can you find a sequence with a better probability? So is there any sequence that you can quickly spot which has a better probability? So if you look at this particular sequence, uh, if you look at 0 0.4, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, you actually have 0 0.288, which is much, much more likely, which has a much, much higher probability than this particular sequence that we decoded with greedy. So this is an example to show that greedy decoding is suboptimal. Um, and this is how it works. So this is an example. Let's look at the code. So now let's see how this is implemented. So the way um, I'm going to again highlight the important parts of the code. Please read through the code and ask us if you have any questions. Okay. So the greedy takes in model batch, batch size and max length. So batch is actually the input that comes in and batch size. Um, so this function does for um, this function can work in batches. So that's why we have this. So uh, let's assume, let's start from here. So I'm going to start by saying that uh, in my prediction, the first one is SOS. And then I'm going to keep a track, track of the score. And then this finish mask is basically uh, something that I'm going to maintain to see if all elements in my batch has finished decoding. And when do we mean that we have finished decoding? If we have hit the end of sentence stack, we say that we have finished decoding. So we keep decoding until we hit the end of sentence. So sometimes if your model is bad or in other situations, it could happen that you don't um, hit the end of sentence stack. So we often also have a limit on the number of times step T that we decode. So that is actually given by this particular quantity max length over here. Okay. So let's happen. Let's look at what happens during a particular time step. So during a particular time step from the model decoder, I get the decoder output, decoder hidden and some attention logs. So what is the thing that I care about? The thing that I care about is actually the decoder output. Okay. So I'm going to do a softmax or a log softmax over the decoder output. And then I'm going to look at the maximum. So uh, max returns two values, which is what is the maximum value and what is the index of the maximum value. And the index of the maximum value, which is a token, is what I care about. So that gets appended to threads, which is the sequence that we are decoding as such. So uh, if you look at the example, in the first one, the score would be 0.5, the log of 0.5, and the thread would be C. So that is the thing that gets appended here. And then uh, two is the index that corresponds to end of sequence. So we check if it's two. If it's two, that basically means you have finished decoding. And if everything is done, if all the sequences in the batch have finished decoding, we break. Okay. So this is how greedy decoding works. Um, are things okay till now? Okay, great. So let's see an example. So here uh, I'm going to give as an input to the model that I trained, your persona, I live in Texas, where are you? So this is what I'm giving as input to the model and then I'm expecting a response from the model. So the model response, I'm from California, where are you from? Um, which I think is a reasonable response, but there's actually something funny here. Let's remove this question mark and see what happens. Nothing happened. Let's remove this question mark and see what happens. Nothing happened. Now I'm going to put a dot here. It asked, I'm from California, how about you? I mean, I don't know why this happens, but you can actually look at these systems, make small changes, and then it will change the output of the system. So you will see about uh, these different decoded tokens and the probabilities of de these tokens in a minute when we are looking at beam search and different paths that it can take through this. Uh, take through this. Route. Okay, we are already half an hour into this. So I'm going to try and speed up. Uh, so nuclear sampling. So we saw here uh, that at every time step, we have this probability distributions, right? And when you have probability distribution, you can always sample from this. So shown 
told in the first lab that you could actually sample from this as a language model and then you generated sentences. And Cho spoke about sampling again today. So here, this is nothing different. This is again a conditioned, uh, conditional language model. So I can sample from here. But often the vocabulary size is so large and there are tokens with really, really small probability. But when we are just doing the naive ancestral sampling, you might pick up a token which is very unlikely and then from there on, the sample becomes like pretty bad. So Cho spoke about top K sampling where you pick uh, the top K elements from vocabulary. Nucleus sampling is something very similar. So in nucleus sampling, what we do is we have a hyperparameter that we call as P nucleus. So this is a threshold that we set. It could be like 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.9, whatever. So it's a threshold that you set. And then what you do is you pick up elements, you find the smallest set of tokens such that if you add the probabilities of all such tokens, that is greater than or equal to P nucleus. So it is similar to top K sampling, but instead of defining the threshold by saying, I'm going to pick five samples or five tokens, I'm going to define a threshold, but I'm going to define a set by putting a threshold on the cumulative probability. Okay, so let's think about it for a minute. Um, if you set P nucleus as really large, like let's say I set my P nucleus as one. So what is this going to be? Is it the same as sampling naively? or is it something different? Any answers on chat? Exactly. So if you pick my, if, you, if I set my P nucleus as one, I essentially have the entire token set. So that means I'm sampling the entire thing. There is nothing going to be different. So what happens if you set P nucleus as a very small value? Is it something that you are already familiar with? Is it something that you already saw? If my P nucleus is pretty small, what happens? my p nucleus is quite small um, so if my p nucleus is really small what is going to be the subset that i'm going to pick often it's going to be just the element with the maximum value right so that way your p nucleus is going to converge towards greedy uh, and your nucleus sampling is going to converge towards greedy if you set your p nucleus to be really really small okay so before we look at the code, let me show you some examples. So this is, uh, this is the input that, I, that we give to the model. So until now, is there any question on nuclear sampling or are we all clear on nuclear sampling? If you're okay with nuclear sampling, say yes. If you have questions, please ask the question. Can you explain it again? Okay. So very quickly, when we are doing, oh. <laughs> uh, Safa, can you mute your microphone if that? When you when you have V vocabulary number size of categories, then it's going to be uh, the samples are going to be pretty bad if you end up picking one element with a small probability. So what we do is instead of doing that, we are going to say instead of sampling over the entire vocabulary, I'm going to pick a subset of tokens. And I'm going to pick the subset of tokens by saying that if I sum up the elements in the token, it's going to be, um, it has to be greater than or equal to a particular threshold, which is P nucleus. And like what is happening in chat now, it is very similar to top K sampling, but instead of saying that I will pick up top K tokens, I'm saying that I will pick up a set such that the probabilities add up to P nucleus. Okay, so uh, now let's look at some examples. So my persona is I read 20 books a year. I'm a stunt double as, I, I'm a stunt double as my second job. I eat only unknown. I was raised in a single parent household. And then the input is, the conversation that happened is, hello, what are you doing today? Okay, so let's look at what happens for different P values. So the P's I have is 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 0.9. And I'm going to sample five, five different samples. So as you can imagine, as my P increases, I'll probably have more diversity within samples. So let's look at P equal to 0 0.1. So in P equal to 0 0.1, all my five samples actually generated the exact same thing. It said, I'm doing well, just got done working out. When P equal to 0 0.5, I have Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Just reading some tea. You? 
I am good. How are you? Hi, I am doing great. How are you? Hi, I am good. Just finished reading a book. When I have p equal to 0.9, hi, how are you today? Hi there. I am a little chilly by myself, but have been a fish. I am thinking about acting. How do you feel about yourself? Hi, I am just watching TV. What do you do? Hi there. I am sad about salt school and having some spaghetti salad. How are you? So if you look at these three examples, which value of p do you prefer? Which value of p do you think generated? best looking examples can you comment on your chat point nine really and consistently okay. uh, there are some people who agree with my notion i think point five generated um, reasonably looking samples the only one that was a bit odd was just reading some tea everything else actually looked quite good but at p equal to 0.9 there were quite a lot of things that was like i'm a little chilly by myself but have been a fish i'm sad about salt school and have some spaghetti salad so there were things that did not make more sense in p equal to 0.9 okay so again uh, the point here is to demonstrate that this hyperparam what when you're doing nuclear sampling it's quite sensitive to hyperparameter when you have p equal to 0.9 you have a lot of tokens so again there are possibility of things going bad and when p equal to 0.1 you are severely restricting your set so you're sampling from a very, very small set. That's why you only have one response that's coming up. So this is something that you want to think about when you're doing top K sampling or nuclear sampling. All right, let's finally go to beam search. So to recap, until now, we basically realized again and again that uh, what you have from the decoder is basically a probability distribution. And then you could pick the, what we are interested in is basically getting the sequence with the best possible uh, probability. So I could sample from here and then see what are the kind of sequences that I get. So that's, we saw a nuclear sampling for that. We also saw greedy search, which was basically trying to approximate um, this search problem by saying that I'm going to greedily pick the best element at every time step. So now let's look at beam search. So in beam search, like you saw in class, what we have is we will have K beams. And what this K beams does is at every time step, I'm going to look at all possible hypotheses. And then I'm going to pick the hypothesis, K best hypothesis, according to the scores, the scores or the probability of the sequences. And then I'm going to keep continuing from there. Okay. So I'm again going to use your help in chat and do beam search. I'm going to use your help in chat and do beam search. Let's look at, uh, let, let's say that I'm going to do K equal to two. So my beam size is two. So what are the beams that are going to be in the first time step? So what are the things I'm going to pick? So you're going to pick B and C in your first time step. Okay. Now in the second time step, what am I going to do? So in the second time step, I'm going to basically, let me actually change the color. Okay, I don't know what happened here. So I'm going to keep the color as such. So in the second time step, I'm basically going to look at all of these hypotheses. Okay. So from each of this, I'm going to expand the vocabulary size dimension. So I'm basically going to look at what happens if I pick B, then I get all of these things. And then what happens if I pick C, I'm going to get all of these things. So I'm going to look at all of these hypotheses. So what's the thing that I'm going to pick? When I have K equal to two, I look at all of these things and then I'm going to pick the two best ones. What are the two best ones here? So somebody told me it's B A, of course. It's B A and it's B B. I wouldn't say it's B B. So B A has a score of 0.36. What's the next best score that you find? The next best score that you find, I believe, is 0 0.5 and 0 0.35. Sorry. So it's 0 0.5 and 0 0.4, 0 0.2, right? So I have CB here. So this, this will be my two beams. So again, to recap, what we had is we had K equal to two. We picked these two things. And then when we came here, we had K times vocabulary size hypothesis. From this, we pick the best two, okay? 
now what do we do again we expand again okay so when i expand again i have all of these and what are the uh, tokens that i'm going to pick so what's the thing that i'm going to pick now so once you expand what are the beams that you're currently considering so you're currently considering this and you are considering this okay now from this what am i going to pick so here i have 0 0.28 8 0 0.036 0 0.036 i have 0 0.006 0 0.08 and 0 0.06 so i'm basically going to pick this particular hypothesis and this particular hypothesis to continue into my future time step okay so we did this example before and when we did greedy we actually went to this particular one which was suboptimal and now here when we did beam we actually went to this 0.288 which was the best possible one here but i want to emphasize that this is a cooked up example where i went to the best possible example when you do beam it's not guaranteed that you're going to get to the best possible one. okay are things clear did you understand beam search so if you understood beam search then oh that was exactly my question if k is equal to one what happens to beam search is it the same as greedy search if k is equal to one and what happens if k is equal to if i set my uh, so if i set my k as mod b if i set my k as vocabulary size is it the same as exhaustive search Hmm. looks like we did not do a good job of explaining it's not so if you look here even if i set k equal to mod b i'm not going to do exhaustive search so an easy way to say see it is at every time step i'm going to look at k times v possible hypothesis so if k is equal to v i'm only looking at v square hypothesis but if you were to do an exhaustive search at this point you should be looking at v raised to t hypothesis okay so the reason is that at every time step we are sub selecting only k beams so even if you set k equal to the vocabulary size it's not the same as exhaustive search but if you set k equal to infinity it's the same as exhaustive search but i mean that's a corner case any questions okay great so let's go back to the code so what we have here um, so this is an example here again we are going to use the same uh, particular example that we dealt with like i read 20 books i'm a stuntable uh, stuntable and we are going to see the beam decoding output okay um, so the beam class is huge and you have a lot of information here we are not going to go through any code of beam search right now because i only have 15 minutes left uh, but i encourage you to go through this and ask us any questions on campus where if you have okay so this is uh, an example of beam search so to implement this beam class with every a uh, particular node we have these entries that we associate time step what is the hypothesis id so each of these yellow lines that you saw is called a hypothesis uh, what is the hypothesis id what is the token id and what is the score the score is basically the probability until that particular point okay so go through this beam class and ask us any questions if you have so now i'm going to go and show you some predictions from beam search okay so uh, again this was the input that we had this is a thing that you saw earlier and then i'm going to do a beam search with beam size 5 that's the k and best beam which is basically just an argument to my function to say how many hypotheses to print so here these are the things that are generated by beam search i'm doing well how are you i'm doing great how are you i'm doing well how about you and all of these and what you see here is the score so uh, which one is better is minus point 8 minus 8.02 better or minus 8.54 better so here this is a log of probability so that's why it's negative and the higher the better since it's negative minus 0.8 minus 8.02 is the better one okay so this is the best answer that we found by doing a beam search and these are actually quite similar if you look at it right so let's actually see what exactly happened when we did beam search on this example so when you do beam search on this example this is how it starts with so it starts with the start token and then these are the first five things that it picked i hi hey hello just okay 
then in the next time step we expanded to five times vocabulary size hypothesis and then we looked at all possible examples and then we picked the best five hypotheses and the best five hypothesis was this start i am start i and then apostrophe start high comma start high exclamation mark and start hello comma okay again at this time step we expanded to k times hypothesis space and this was the next set of things that we had so we keep expanding this we keep expanding like this until we hit like these things so do you see so this is how the search actually went through uh, so this is how the beam this is what we call as beam tree or this is how the search actually went through um, if people are able to understand this particular uh, graph or the tree can you say yes in chat and if you are not able to understand the tree can you say no okay i have a mix of yes and no's okay let's so again so what we are doing here is very similar to what we did here okay so here we did beam with k equal to 2 and in the first step we picked b and c so here we are doing doing k as 5 and in the first step i hi hey hello and just other things that we picked then in the next step from b we expanded to c and from c we expanded to b okay so that's what is happening here from i i expanded to am and apostrophe from he i expanded to these and so on so this is exactly what like what we did here but with a real example and um, a larger vocabulary size so here if you keep seeing at this particular time step we actually um, discarded all the other trees and we only proceeded with m and i and then the i one died out after the next step and then all the final predictions that we got were actually from this particular tree start i am and then you can see like i am doing i am good so i mean i think i am great is also a reasonable choice but according to this particular conversation model uh, there are better choices like this okay so you can see that we finally go until we hit until we hit the end of um, until we hit the end of sentence stack and these are the scores associated with each of these tokens each of these uh, prediction sequences okay um, so now let's see what happens if we do a higher batch size so here let's see that uh, the best possible prediction that we had was i am doing well how are you so if i do a beam size of 20 then these are the choices so the best score we got there was minus point uh, minus 8.02 so if I do a beam size of 20, I can actually get, I can actually find a better sequence which says I am doing well and you, which has a score of minus 7.5. And I am doing well, how are you? Which was our best choice with beam size five is actually here. So I have a question for you. So if I add a larger beam size, if I do beam search with a larger beam search, beam size, is it necessary that the solution that I found with the smaller beam size should be included in the hypothesis? Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to answer my own question and say that it's no. And to show that, I'm going to do this beam size, beam search with beam 50. So I can find a better hypothesis, but if you go through all of these hypotheses, you will see that this best answer that we got with beam search five is not included within this. Okay. All right. Uh, so the beam tree for this, so uh, the probability for each node is basically the probability of the sequence up to that particular point so this is a huge beam tree when you have time and you have nothing else to do please look through this beam tree and exclaim at its beauty okay so um, i mean i don't really have anything to show here this is another random input that i sampled from the validation data loader and then I did beam search and these are the different sequences that it generates. So there it was just the first thing. So the answer was more or less standardized. So here you can see that there's actually a lot of diversity in the samples that you get from beam search. Okay. Uh, so this is something called I3D beam search that Joe spoke about briefly uh, during the lecture. So we have explained what I3D beam search is and we give you the entire code for that, but we are not going to go through it now. 
when you have time please go through this again okay let's finally do the interactive chatbot so this is what we have been looking for so um, so this is the persona that we gave for the bot i love to drink wine and dance in the moonlight i'm very strong for my age i'm 100 years old i feel like i might live forever okay so let's start with saying hi how are you so the bot responds i'm good how are you so i'm going to say i'm good Actually, sorry, the board likes to dance. So. Do you like I do. So the greedy board says that uh, I do. I like to hike and hike. To say great, I like hiking. I like to hike and hike. I like to hike and hike. So it basically just says the same thing again. So I'm going to quit this and go to the board with nuclear sampling. I'm going to say this again. Hi, how are you? So it's the exact same model that we are using here. The only difference is what is the decoding method that we are using. So it says, I'm good. How are you? Um, it's exactly the same as before. So I'm going to say my exact same response. I'm good. Do you like to dance? Oh, it says I do. I'm a bit of a loner. I'm a loner too. I'm a teacher. I'm very excited. Okay, so you get responses like this. Let's do beam search. So I'm going to do a beam search with beam size of five. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I do I like to hike and hike so it's actually saying almost the same thing as uh, it's saying almost the same thing as greedy Great. I like hiking what do you do for a living let's say I teach students what city are you from I live in Los Angeles. So it actually does something reasonable. So I would like to remind you that this again is, uh, uh, this again is kind of, what do you say? Um, this is a model that you trained. This is exactly the model that you trained using this notebook. It's trained on a, it's a very small model trained on a very small data set. And it actually does something reasonable. So now I have changed the beam search. Uh, uh, just uh, for Solomon, please stop your kernel and start again. I probably haven't accounted for the case that you would put in a zero input. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. No, I don't do it. So here you see that. Um, if I use a larger beam search, it actually doesn't um, stick to it persona. So the decoding, um, all I want to say here is the decoding can vary quite a bit based on the beam size that you use. Okay. I like to dance. Okay. So this conversation can go on. So here uh, we have a chatbot which basically gives you responses from all the three. So this chatbot basically give you responses from all the three decoding strategies. So play with it when you have time and let us know what you think. I have a persona at the end. So the persona is I study machine learning. I live in Kigali. I'm very smart. I love NLP. 
let's look at what happens for this. Let's just say hi. I'm good. You like an okay. Bot said no, I do not know. I'm going to be a chef. The sampling bot said I do. I like to hike and eat sweets. I do. I like to hike and row. So um, I sort of want to point out that I kind of misled, misled you here by saying that uh, showing you uh, asking like do you like NLP and it says I do. But that doesn't have to be the case. So let me show you another example where I do the exact same thing again. Now I'm going to type some gibberish. So it's going to say the exact same thing. It's basically happening because NLP is mapping to unknown token. That's the same thing that is happening with this gibberish that I wrote. So this is a very small model whose vocabulary is quite small. So you're not going to see a lot of uh, amazing things happen with this. But to see amazing things happen, go to this particular document and follow all the steps that we have written here. So this uh, installs Parlay, Parlay, which is a library. And then this commands let you interact with already pre-trained large models for dialogue modeling. So I have a seek to seek model here. That's the one that this launches. But if you go to this particular website, in the model zoo, you will see a lot more different kind of models. So for example, this one is really good. So try conversing with this one and let us know what you think about it. Okay, so I have two minutes. So if you have any questions, I'll take them. Was the lab clear so far? So we basically went, uh, we started with uh, saying that dialogue modeling is a special case of seek to seek. We saw how to um, format your data so that it goes as input to the seek to seek model and it lets you do dialogue modeling. And then we trained the model and then we uh, re-emphasized that the decoding part is essentially just a a probability so uh, the decoding part the de well, essentially what this is doing is learning conditional probability and what we are interested in is getting sequences with high probability so we looked at um, so we saw that there are lots of sequences so exhaustive search is not possible one heuristic to do this is greedy search and we looked at greedy search then we looked at um, sampling methods which is nucleus sampling and you saw that for different values of p nucleus you get different kind of samples and then we finally went to beam search and we saw how beam search works and looked at a couple of beam trees by hand okay any other questions So there is no uh, domain associated with this, with this here, but if you're talking about persona, you can actually see examples of how I'm giving persona to the chatbot. Okay, all right. So if you have any questions, please go through the code and ask us questions on Campusfire. So we'll see you again in the next lecture.